Edwin J. Films Producciones presenta to the program of the night. Uh, for the ones that do not know, Brother Mero is the president of the Southeast US Film Awakening. And we'll um, transfer the word to him right away for him to explain this team to us. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. This evening we are going to continue this very important topic of the reformation of the Protestant, revival of the Protestant Reformation. And I'm sure that all of you that have been here since the very beginning, you have been blessed by the messages as we have a record, the story, the, the history, how the Church of God has moved throughout the ages. And this evening we are going to speak about a great religious awakening. I would like to, uh, before I read the Revelation, I would like to remind you that the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in the second epistle that in this last generation, he said, many will turn their ears from the truth and they will be turned into fables. So this is why we need to go into the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak accordingly, there is no lie in it. So in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, we found the message to one of the seven churches of the book of Revelation. The spirit of prophecy says that the seven messages, the, 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 church, the messages to the churches apply to our people today, not just the Laodicea message. So the message to the Church of Sardis has a very, very special application to us as well. He said, and unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things said he that had the seven spirit of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. So this message is addressed to nominal people. So they have the name that they are Christian, but they're not. They have the name that they're Protestant, but they're not Protestant. They have the name that is only a profession of faith. So in keep in mind that this message was given to the church of the Christian people that came and established themselves in the in North America region, and they found prosperity here. So, because they were, they have an easy life here, they began to make money and to increase in goods and all these things. This is the message addressed to them. Say, so you have the name that thou are, that you live, but you are in reality dead. Verse 2 says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. So this is another lesson to us. God will not accept any less than perfection. He said, I have not found your work perfect before me, so then you need to move on. You need to strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. And it's sad to say, but in this generation, there are many, many professed Christians in similar condition. Say so they are nominal, but they're ready to die. So the Lord counsel here is be watchful and strengthen the things with which remain. And if this is your condition here this evening, this is God's uh, this is God's message for you. In verse three says, "Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch." I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Now, the direct application of this was fulfilled when Jesus came in 1844 to the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary, and they didn't know. They were not waiting for Jesus. They were misinterpreting the prophets, and they were waiting Jesus coming upon this earth so this is why he said, if you don't watch, then I will come upon you as a thief. And you know the history of the great disappointment, how they couldn't understand the work of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary when it's so clear in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews, and many other books. 
So this message was given to them. But again, it has an application also to our time. And uh, for those in such a condition, there is a great need of a revival. There is a need of a revival. In, um, in 1882, the spirit of prophecy wrote about the condition of the professed Christians, of those who received the light of the three angels' message. And this is what she wrote. He said, the church has turned back from following Christ, her leader, and is steadily retreating toward Egypt. Yet few are alarmed or astonished as the one of spiritual power. Now notice what, what a condition. The church was not going to a heavenly Canaan. They were going back to Egypt. Why did she say that? What is the condition of the church today? Is it different to that? Let's continue reading here. It said, Yet few are alarmed, not so well, doubt, and even this belief of the testimony of the Spirit of God is leavening our churches everywhere. So what was the problem at that time? This belief of the testimony of the Spirit of prophecy. When the health message was given, what did they do? They rejected. All these messages, they rejected one by one, and unfortunately, this is the sad reality today. He said, doubt, even disbelief of the testimony, are leavening our churches everywhere. That was written in 1882. 1882. It is recorded in volume 5, Testimony for the Church, page 217. Now, what is the solution for that? Revival was needed. A revival. And I think we need the revival today. In uh, Review and Herald, July 24, 1888, it says, spiritual death has come upon the people that should be manifesting life and zeal, purity and consecration by the most earnest devotion of the cause of the truth. So what is she call here? Spiritual death. Now, I wouldn't say this is a this is a need for a revival. This is a need for a resuscit resuscitation <laughs> or resurrection. Because he said he is spiritual death. And they continue. He said the fact concerning the real condition of the professed people of God speak lo more loudly than their profession and make it evident that some power has cut the cable that anchored them to the eternal rock and that they are drifting away to the sea without chart or compass. So this is another symbol used by the spirit of prophecy to illustrate the condition of the way that the church was going in those times. He says here that some type of power has cut up the cable that anchored them to the eternal rock. So that was a very sad condition that the church was found in those days. <clears throat> it is in such a condition that the message of Revelation 18 is sent. Revelation 18 verse 1 it said, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. I praise the Lord for this prophecy here, because regardless the condition of the churches today, there is still a prophecy that says that there is a mighty angel coming, and the result is that the whole earth will be lightened with his glory. So that's Revelation 18 and verse 1. In Great Controversy, page 464, in supporting of this message here, he said, Before the final visitation of God's judgment upon this earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of the primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. So this is the great awakening that we are looking for. This is the awakening that you and I need to participate. 
not to be left behind in the Laodicean condition, not in the condition of the Church of Sardis. We don't want to be nominal at Venice. We don't want to be nominal Protestants. We want to be real Christian to testify that Christ has power to change and transform lives. So he says here, the spirit and power of God will be poured out upon his children. So what is the difference here? Say that the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon the people. The outpouring of the latter rain. And when is that going to happen? He says yeah, before the final visitation of God's judgment. So I mean before the seven last plagues. That revival must take place before. And he continued. He said, at that time, many will separate themselves from those churches in which the love of this world has supplanted love for God and His Word. So what is the problem in these churches? He said, the love of the world, which is pronounced to be what? Enmity with God. According to James chapter 4 and verse 4, it said, friendship with the world is enmity with God. So he says here that there will be a separation Say we will have to separate from from whom? He said from those churches in which the love of this world has supplanted love for God and His Word. Many, both the ministers and people, will gladly accept those great truths which God has caused to be proclaimed at this time to prepare people for the Lord's second coming. So this separation is not going to be only among lay members. He said ministers, leadership, they will gladly accept what? The original truth. This morning we study about the old landmarks, the old path according to Jeremiah 6 16. He said, Stand ye on the way in the way and seek and ask for the old path and walk there. There is no safety any other way. He says that that separation, when that revival really take control of the whole world, so that separation will take place. He said, many both of ministers and people will gladly accept those great truths which God has caused to be proclaimed at this time as a preparation for the Lord's second coming. Don't forget that when the, the description of the second coming of Christ is given in Revelation chapter 6, the question that is asked is who shall be able to stand then to prepare people to stand in the day of God, this kind of work must be done. So a great work of reformation or of restoration. The, the next part here, he said, the enemy of Saul desired to hinder this work, and before the time for such a movement shall come, he will endeavor to prevent it by introducing a counterfeit. In those churches which he brings under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. So Satan will try to uh, make a counterfeit to confuse many people, and you've seen this today. You know, there are many type of uh, revivals going on in different places, and when we think about revival, we immediately think about churches full of people, but the type of revival that uh, prophecy speaks about is not just a bunch of people. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Is a real restoration of God's image in you. This is what the revival is all about. That's what happened in the time of the apostles. They have to spend 10 days in examining their own selves and confessing to one another and to reconsecrating their life. Then they were able to be able to witness unto the Lord. They were not able to do it before that. He said, there will be manifest 
what is thought to be great religious interest. Multitude will exalt that God is working marvelously for them when the word is of what? Is of another spirit. So notice how deceptive it is. Say that people will not realize of what kind of spirit is moving those things. So, say under a religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence upon the Christian world. So you see uh, mega churches today praising God and singing, many proclaiming uh, crusades and things like that, and there is no change. People remain the same. There is no consecration to the Lord, and Christ is forgotten. It is at this thing, after this thing, that another angel is sent. Why? In volume 8, Testimony for the Church, it said, It is a solemn and terrible truth that many who have been zealous in proclaiming the third angel's message are now becoming listless and indifferent. The line of demarcation between worldly and many professed Christians is what? Almost indistinguishable. Very long word. Yeah. I can hardly pronounce it. So, the line that is supposed to make a clear distinction between God's people and the people of the world cannot even see, cannot even be seen anymore. It is almost, she said when she wrote uh, at least a hundred years ago, in volume eight, said at that time it is almost indistinguishable. So now if I ask you what about today? What is the condition of the world today? What is the condition of the popular churches? Those who profess the three angels message. What is the condition? It is something for us to think. Because we are not um, immunized in falling in such a condition. <coughs> say, he that thinketh he is standing, say, they he let he, let he fall. <coughs> I was shown three steps. The first, second, and the third angel's message. <coughs> Woe to him who shall move a block or steer a pin of these messages. The true understanding of these messages is of vital importance. And notice the underlying part that says the destiny of souls depends or hangs upon the manner in which they are received. So brethren, if we will summarize the plan of salvation in this last generation, we'll have to come up with the three the, the three angels message. So the destiny of souls hangs upon the manner in which they are received. So if we fail to understand or to proclaim these messages correctly, so our destiny is there. We may be lost forever. So this is serious. This is of vital importance. So what to him who shall move the block of still a pin of these messages? This morning we read about a supposedly uh, revival that will take place among Seventh-day Adventist believers. So this revival will uh, consist in giving up some of the pillars of the faith, some of the doctrines. So how can revival take place unless we go back to the old path? Unless we go back to the old landmark? Say, woe to him who shall move a block of still the of these messages. It is after these things that the fourth angel or that other angel is sent with a message of waiting or awakening. And verse 2 in Revelation 18 said, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is falling, is falling. And it's become the habitation of devils, and the hope of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. In order for any church to declare 
that Babylon is falling, God should not be free from Babylonian promises. You cannot be clear that Babylon has fallen if you're still in Babylon. If you're still practicing those things that come from Babylon. And it's interesting that in, uh, in chapter 4 of the book of Daniel, a dream was given to Nebuchadnezzar. And in that dream, he saw a huge tree. And the order was given, cut the tree. And it was cut. But they left uh, the, uh, the stump. And what happened? So the group were there and they, he, he gathered uh, nutrients already and the tree went up again. So Babylonian practices are infiltrated everywhere. The roots of Babylon comes everywhere, come to our homes, to our schools, to our different institutions. So we must be careful. So this angel of Revelation 18 declare or is saying Babylon the Great is falling and he has become habitation of devil and, and so forth. So, so this is, and verse three, for all nations have drunk of the wine to the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of, of earth are waxed rich through the abundance of their delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her place. So there is a close connection between the prophecy we read before. It said that will take place before the final visitation of God's judgment upon this earth. There will be a separation. He said, it is in response to this command here, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her place. It's interesting that one of the plates, or the first plate, fall upon all the men that has the mark of the beast. So this we can call that will be the only universal, universal plate. Because the whole world will be divided in two classes. Those who have the seal of the living God, which will be a small remnant, and the whole world. Because he said the first plague fall upon those who have the mark of the beast, and they have a, a sword. It was a plague of sword. Painful, very painful. And uh, so that goes all the way, and you know that the place will be um, accumulative, so they will not be taken away. Once you receive a plate, you will not be free of it. You will not. So, so, this is a, so God's command is call, calling people from Babylon to join God's people, to join those who are seeking to restore God's image in their lives, those who are seeking to reform the old past, those who are seeking to remain on the truth. Because otherwise, he said, we will receive the place. Now, what is it, a revival necessary? Remind me the time when Jesus gathered his disciples before his departure to, uh, to heaven. The disciples came to him and asked him questions and Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel in this time? That was interesting for them to know. But the Jesus told them, say, it is not for you to know those things. There is something more important. Say, ye shall receive power. This is what is more important. Ye shall receive power. And then when you receive this power, say, you shall be witnesses some to me, and in Samaria, and in Judea, and unto the uttermost part of this earth. Now, in Matthew 24, describing the condition of the world today, he said, 
And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. This is what we see today, brethren. Iniquity is everywhere. So this is a prophecy given by Christ. But together with this iniquity, the next verse is very important too. Verse 14. He said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, not just as a theory, not just as an argument, but notice how. He said, for a witness unto all nations, and they shall be, and then shall the end come. So notice that when you talk about revival, do not think about great multitudes or great uh, display or great things. Think about deep consecration. Think about individuals like a John the Revelator. Oh, I said, somebody said that we should not call him the Revelator because the Revelation was given by Christ. So John, the Apostle, said these men, he had the privilege to witness for Christ because he looked like Christ. Remember when they put him in the, in the island of Patmos? So there in that uh, island full of criminals, he found converts there. They put him in the pot with oil, uh, boiling oil. He could not burn. Whenever he went, the people, this must be Jesus. This must be Jesus. This man, it was not because he spoke. It was because of he lived Christianity for himself. So then this is what the prophecy says. Say this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the world for the witness unto all nations. Because many, many understand and they have a theory of the truth. I have heard many people, you know, they make sense, they explain different things carefully, very well. But their life is not corresponding. So this is only professors. We could not just follow individuals because they explain the Bible well. No. So we're looking for witnessing. This is what matters. This is what the Lord is looking for. This is what revival is all about. And uh, this is the text that I mentioned to you. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He said, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now notice what the difference is made by the Holy Spirit. That's what, uh, that's what makes a difference in an individual. So the proclamation of the gospel will not be by might or power, according to Zechariah 4, 6. Say, no by might, no by power, but my spirit, said the Lord. So this is what the uh, revival said, the spirit of God, and is given with one condition. According to Acts chapter 5, verse 32, it said, the Holy Spirit is being given only to those who obey him. Those who obey him. And the Holy Spirit is not a, uh, a sentiment or a feeling. The Holy Spirit is a reality. It's an invisible power that you can see reflected in an individual when they show the fruits. The fruits of the Spirit. So that's what makes a difference in the individual. In Acts chapter 3 verse 19, this is what prophecy said for this time, which was the same message given by Christ. Remember when Christ came, began his ministry for the dusty roads of Jerusalem, he said, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Peter is saying here that this is the message for today. This is what we need. We do not need as much as enticing sermons or exciting messages. We need messages to call people to repent. 
deep repentance and conversion. This is the revival. This is the great awakening that will come upon this earth. So repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the time for refreshing shall come to the presence of the Lord. So the refreshing will come when? When? When we experience true repentance. It was not until the disciples, the apostles, they truly repented. They were no longer striving for the highest place. They were no longer doing that. They were not seeking to, to, uh, to be in the best positions anymore. When Peter went into the temple, and there was a man asking for arms, and then Peter came close to him and asked, you know, look at us. He was expecting some, some type of coin or money. He said, we have no money, but what we have, we give you. Say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, arise and walk. This is what the power of God manifested. No money. It's not great institutions, great speakers, or great uh, television programs. Say, it's uh, what we do, what we have, we give you. We have the Holy Spirit. When Jesus gave the Holy Spirit to the disciples, he said, go to different homes. And when you arrive to a home, say you say, the peace of God be in this house. If they receive you, say, go inside, enjoy the company. If they reject you, say, even the, the shoes, you know, the dust of the shoes, get it away and continue on. This is what, uh, this is true Christianity. <clears throat> the time of refreshing. Verse 20. He said, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Let me give you a secret. I'll tell you a secret. Christ will not come until something important be done. What is that something important that must be done? Verse 21. He said, whom the heaven must receive, and if you look at this word, you can also say the heaven must hold on to it or retain until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Speaking about this was when Sister White wrote in Prophets and Kings, page 501, it says, actually 678, said, in the time of the end, every divine institution is to be restored. When? In the time of the end, it said, every divine institution is to be restored. It said, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come, not before. So why is it that Jesus hasn't come yet? Because we're not ready? Because we are still struggling in this world. Because we are unfaithful. But he said that the heaven is the one holding Jesus there until the time of restitution of all things. God's people in this last generation, calling themselves reformers, according to Isaiah 58 and verse 12, repairs of the bridge, say we're supposed to restore all divine institutions, specifically the two main ones, marriage, which is a family, and the Sabbath. And Sister White said that these two institutions, the twin, so they go hand in hand. So, this is why you read the prophecy in which the, the Old Testament concludes. It said, before I send you Elijah, the prophet, before the dreadful day of the Lord. 
And what is Elijah does? Say so he will turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the children to the father unless I come and smite you with a curse. So before the plagues, there must be a reformation taking place in God's people, in the family, in the, in the Sabbath, in the diet, and all these things have been revealed to us at least over a year, over a hundred years ago. All these things. So, it says that this time of restitution, the time of reformation, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets in the world began. This morning, Brother Enrique gave us a good recollection of the history of Christianity. From the, not even Christianity, from the very beginning, how God has a message from the very beginning, and that message never changed. We change. But the truth is about the same. This is why the first angel's message said, he brings nothing new. Say, I bring the everlasting gospel. The same gospel was proclaimed to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's the same gospel that we proclaim today. The same message. God will not accept anything else. Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So there is no salvation without the gospel. And keep in mind that the gospel is a part of God unto salvation to those who believe. And how do you prove that you believe? Those who have faith. Faith without works is what? Is death. So the only way that you can claim that you believe the gospel for salvation is when you obey the principles established through the gospel. So Christ will not come until that time. Now the Lord sent a message of awakening to the other people. And that's what the, uh, the, the Spirit of Prophecy wrote in Testimony to Minister, page 91, said, The Lord in His great mercy sent a most precious message to His people through elders, governors, and Jonas. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the afflicted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the, the whole world. He presented justification through faith in the surety. He invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest. How? In obedience. Is that related to the gospel? You know, the gospel is a part of God unto salvation only to those who believe, those who have faith. He said, this message is a Christ righteousness which was given in 1888 in Minneapolis, in the state of Minnesota. He said, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many have lost sight of Jesus. What was the problem there? He said, they ran away from the truth. They claim that they did not understand the Bible anymore. And I, I like the statement made by Sister White. She said, people do not need the testimony of the spirit of prophecy. And there is no need for this. But because people claim that they do not understand the Bible, say so now the Lord give them testimony so they have no excuse. But the, the Bible is, is, is more clear than the testimony. So, the Lord sent them this message. And uh, in this uh, volume 6, page 19, testimony for the church, it said, The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end to the earth to the, to the other to prepare the way of the Lord. This is what? This is the glory of God which closes the work of the third angel. 
So remember that the angel of Revelation 18 says, says, after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, and the whole earth was lightened with his glory. Now what is that glory? It says here that this message that was sent inviting the people to accept the righteousness of Christ, which is manifested in obedience to all his commandments, he said, this is the glory of God, which closes the, for the work of the ten angels. Don't look for revival any other way. It is not possible. If you look at it in any other way, then uh, you will be disappointed. You may be excited for a week or two, and after that you will go back to do the same thing. You will do the same. So revival, it is only when we accept the truth as it was revealed from the very beginning. In testimony uh, to minister, page 91, he said, This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a large measure. Now, according to history, this message was brought to Adventism to a delegation in session by the, the two elders that we read before, Wagoners and Jones. This message was to, pro, be, was to uh, be given to give a revival. But unfortunately, the message was sadly rejected. And you know, you can go to the books and, and read for yourself the great disappointment uh, of Ellen G. White and some of the leadership at that time. But this was the message. So that was the Thin Angel's message in reality. He said that that was supposed to be attended by the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. After that, there was a separation in Adventism because God would never but I mean never be without a church. This is a quotation for the Spirit of Prophet said. The great shepherd will never be without a church. When a people go into apostasy, look around because God has some disciples somewhere. He has some faithful ones. Look around. Like in the time of Jesus, when Jesus said, your house is left unto you desolate. They continue doing all the kind of services. But what happened? The Lord was not there. The Lord was meeting in a very humble house, in an upper room with the disciples. If you are looking after great display, I can tell you this much you will be confused. The truth sometimes comes to you in a way that you never expect. It reminds me when Nathaniel, when uh, Philip brought Nathaniel. Or who brought? Yeah. Yeah, Philip brought Nathaniel. He told him and said, I have found of which Moses wrote, wrote in the law. Say, who are you talking about? Said Jesus of Nazareth. When he heard the word Nazareth, what happened? Prejudice came up and said, Nazareth? Can something good come out of Nazareth? And then he did not try to uh, argue. He said, come and see. And then he brought him to Jesus. And it's interesting that Jesus, immediately he came and said, this is a true Israelite. So how do you know me? How do you know me? He said, when you were on the bed, what's the name of that? The fig tree. The fig tree, I saw you. 
say, what? You know, it's interesting that that tree was something private. He never thought that somebody saw him because he was praying there. And in his prayer, he was asking the Lord to, for them, to bring the Messiah. He asked the Lord, the Lord, I want to see the Messiah. Show it to me. And then he said, I saw you when you were there praying. He got so impressed. And Lord, you are the king of Israel. You are, because I told you this, you believe? Come, and you will see greater things. Brethren, the truth is the most beautiful thing that we can even imagine. Say so we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. When Paul was preaching in one occasion, and he preached such a good sermon, say, wow, you're such a good preacher. And then Paul said, let every man be a liar and God the true one. He's the only one. So, this message that was given in 1888, according to Selected Messages, Book 1, page 363, said, the time of test, the time of test is just upon us. For the loud cry of the third angel has already begun. In the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin pardon and redeemer. This is what? This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth with his glory. So let us understand this here. He says here that in the message Christ's righteousness that was given to Adventism in 1888, he said that that was the, law, the beginning of the law of Christ. And she emphasized, he said, this is the beginning. So somehow, the revival is going on. If you don't see it, go like Nathaniel and pray under the tree and ask the Lord to reveal to you. He will reveal it. I'm sure. Yeah, he will. Go and praise the Lord. Show me where is these people that are reviving themselves. He may be around you. He may be behind you. And you don't see it. But again, don't look for great display. Because you may be disappointed. Don't look for great display. Look for the principle of Christianity. Look for consecration. Look for the power of the witnessing that Christ promised to his disciples. This is what the, this is what the, the true revival is. In uh, volume 6, page 119, said, those who bear the last message of mercy to the world should feel it their duty to instruct parents in regard to one religion. Now, how can you identify those who are caring for the revival? Here's the next. So the great reformatory movement must begin in presenting to fathers and mothers and children the principle of what? Of the law of God. There is no revival if not if, if, if the Sabbath is not kept sacred. It's no revival if the health message is not practiced. It's no revival if there is no reverence for the sanctuary of God. It's no revival. Then it's excitement. And don't be confused. He said the great reformatory or the great revival movement must begin in presenting the principles of the Ten Commandments. He said the principle of the law of God. This is a, a guidance. 
And we know that the glory of Christ is revealed in the Ten Commandments. Volume 1, Selected Messages, page 240 said, The glory of Christ is revealed in the law, which is a transcription, or is a transcript of his character. And his transforming efficacy is felt upon the soul until man become changed to his likeness. So this is why Satan is so against the Ten Commandments. Because in Psalm 19 said, the law of God is perfect. And what does it do? Converting the soul. There is no conversion if you don't bring the law. It's not true repentance. It is excitement if you don't do that. Say, the law of God is perfect converting the soul. <laughs> now, you may, we understand, and uh, those of you who do not agree with me, we understand that the message of revival of the loud cry of the third angel began with the message Christ righteousness which God separated a group of people and ever since has been proclaiming the original truth as was given to the other movement or to the original pioneers. Um, now, uh, the angel of Revelation 18 covered the whole earth. So it has to be a, a worldwide movement. And even though we haven't reached several countries or some countries in this world, notice what it says here. Early writings 277 it says, the message of the fall of Babylon, which is the same message, as given by the second angel is repeated with the additional mention of the corruption which have been entering the churches since 1844. The work of this angel comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message as it what? As it swells to a loud cry. What does he mean, that word here, swells? Isn't that increases, right? So, according to this, because I have spoken to many people and they claim that they don't see the great display of the four angel in the reform book. Okay, you may not see it. But according to this testimony here, he said that it began in 1844, in, in 1888, and it swells to a loud price, so will be increasing. Now, the increase has been slow, maybe I could admit, maybe it's slower than, than it should have been, but the problem is us. This is the problem. You cannot look at the problem in others. The problem is us. You know, God is waiting, he's longing, to upon his spirit upon his people. But we're not ready for that. We're not ready. But according to this, he said the third angel's message, he says, swells to a loud cry. So it began in 1888. It's been going on. This is the beginning. And will increase and become what? A loud cry. That's what he said. And another testimony here, testimony to ministry, page 411. So Satan has laid every mention possible that nothing shall come upon us as a people to reprove and rebuke us and exhort us to put away our error. But notice here. It's a but, there's a big but here. There is a people who will bear the ark of God. So here is not talking about an independent movement or any group that will come out 
with some ideas of the message. No. He said, here he says, a people. A people, if you look it up in the dictionary, is a group of individuals united by some form of organization. And so there is a people who will bear the heart of God. The truth will not be diminished or lose its power in their hands. They will show the people the transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. So, one minute. Okay, I'm coming to my conclusion here. So don't don't panic. <laughs> so this work of revival, let me emphasize over and over again, symbolizes a movement. This is what is found in Great Controversy 604. Say, hence the movement symbolized by the angel coming down from heaven, lightening the earth with his glory, and crying mightily with a strong voice, announcing the sins of Babylon. So according to this testimony here, say the angel of Revelation 18, the work done by this angel symbolizes a movement. Uh, when our church was organized in 1925, the brethren, understanding this principle, said, let us call ourselves reform movement. Now, let us understand that we are not a reformed church. So if we would be a reformed church, we would have been in heaven already. We are a reformed movement. We're going, we're reaching to the, the perfection, or we're moving toward reaching of the total reformation. And when that takes place, he said, our message, our church will swell to a loud cry, and that will be the great conclusion of the history of this world. This is my conclusion. Now let me ask you, and I'm not asking you from me, I'm just quoting from the spirit of prophecy. So let me ask you, what are you doing to prepare for this work? Are you building for eternity? You must remember that this angel represents the people that have this message to give to the world. Are you among that people? Are you? I think that there's another question here. The question of, of most vital importance for this time is, who is in the Lord's side? Who will unite the old, we will, Who will unite the angel in giving the message of truth to the world? Who will receive the light that is to fill the whole earth with His glory? So all these questions, as I, as I read here, are of vital importance. I urge you to to investigate all these principles here, to make a research for yourself. Look around. God has a people upon this earth. And as Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. May the Lord bless us and help us that we may be the true reformers, that we may take part for that revival. You and I can make a difference in this world. Let us make that difference. Amen. Amen.